Good afternoon and welcome to the lunchtime service from All Souls Church. My name is Alistair Gledhill. I lead these midweek meetings here. You've joined us for the last in a series where we've been going through Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians uh, since the start of the year. Uh, we've taken a tour through this great book, trying to draw out some lessons for life uh, in all of its fullness, uh, as we've seen Paul trying to apply truths of the gospel to each area of our lives. Starting next week, uh, we've got a series coming up leading us up towards Easter, where we're gonna be journeying through Matthew's gospel, through his account of Holy Week, that final week of Jesus' life, and bit by bit, building up a picture of what Jesus came to do, so that as we arrive at Easter, uh, I hope we'll be prepared in our hearts uh, to respond to him with worship. Let me issue two invitations uh, at the start of this little meeting here. Uh, the first is to say that a number of us gather each week after this service has streamed uh, between 1.30 and 2 o'clock each Thursday lunchtime on Zoom to pick up on some of the themes of the passage of the Bible that we've been looking at together, uh, just to mull them over together, uh, to have a chat and to catch up with one another, to encourage one another as we seek to apply these things to our lives. If you'd like to join us for that, we would love to have you with us. Uh, the place to get in touch is to drop me an email, workplace at allsouls.org. If you send me a message there, uh, I'll send you the details and we'd love to connect with you. The other invitation is a slightly cheeky one. Uh, I spend most of my time these days working for Christianity Explored Ministries, uh, a ministry that's grown out of the life of all souls here. Uh, and this evening, Thursday the 11th of February, is our annual Love Live Tell evening. Uh, we've got just 45 minutes, it's an online uh, show a bit like this, uh, where you can sit back and watch and hear about our ministry, uh, how the Lord has been at work over this past year, particularly as many things have gone online, and what we're preparing for, for the future, in future developments. Uh, we'd love to have you with us if you'd like to join us. Uh, you can just uh, watch in, it's a, a stream on YouTube like this is. Uh, the place to find it is to go to ceministries.org forward slash LLT 2021. It's 7.30 until 8.15 this evening. Well, that is uh, ahead for later today. Uh, let me read uh, our passage for today. Uh, we're at the very end of the book of 1 Thessalonians, uh, just a few verses uh, this lunchtime. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 from verse 12. Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard in love because of their work live in peace with one another. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive, encourage the disheartened, help the weak, be patient with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Hold on to what is good. Reject every kind of evil. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. Brothers and sisters, pray for us. Greet all God's people with a holy kiss. I charge you before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers and sisters. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And a quick word of prayer. Our Father God, as we have the scriptures open this lunchtime, we pray that you would speak to us of your Son by your Spirit. And we ask it for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. In my home, I have a desk. And on the right-hand side of my desk, I have a set of drawers. 
And in the top drawer, I keep the following items. Paracetamol, lip balm, a Stanley knife, spare keys to my flat, spare keys to somewhere else, but I can't for the life of me remember where, some AA batteries, some PVA glue, some foreign currency, business cards, nail clippers, a checkbook. I could go on, but I probably don't need to. I don't think I need to describe any more of what's in this drawer because I can guess with quite some confidence that you have a drawer like that as well. Everyone seems to. It's the place in your home where you stuff all the things that you know are important and that you need to be able to access quickly, but which don't really belong anywhere else. They matter, they're useful, but they don't really need a place to be stored all of their own. And if you're wondering what on earth this has to do with the Apostle Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians, well done for bearing with me, Here's my point. As in his other letters, in this one, Paul has written quite logically and methodically about some of the issues facing the church in Thessalonica. Everything has belonged in a discrete unit, and I hope we've seen some order to the flow of his argument as we've gone through the letter over these past six weeks. But here, as we come to the final little section at the end of the letter, it feels as if Paul has opened up the top drawer in the desk of his mind and listed some of the things that he's stored there. They are important things. They're things that we can't afford to lose sight of. We've got to have them close to hand. We'll want to access them regularly. It's just that they don't really belong anywhere else. So they belong together in the important things drawer. In my important things drawer at home, I have a few small boxes and containers that help to keep these assorted items in some sort of order. And I'm going to attempt to do the same with these verses here. Uh, three broad containers to keep Paul's parting instructions to us together. Uh, they speak first into church life, then into the whole of life, and finally into our inner life. So first, uh, let's start with a glance at verses 12 and 13, which I've roughly contained with the heading, honor your leaders, honor your leaders. Uh, let me read those verses. Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard in love because of their work. I'm told by those whose gifts in Greek translation are better than mine that these three instructions here all relate to the same object. What Paul is talking about here is a group of people who work or serve among the Thessalonians, caring for them in the Lord and admonishing them. It seems fairly clear from the context that he's talking about church leaders. And we know from earlier in the letter that there have been some disagreements within the church, which Paul has sought to clarify with his teaching in order to quell those divisions. But he's even had to defend himself as a leader and his model of ministry. So it would be no surprise if the leaders on the ground in Thessalonica were facing some dissent in the ranks in Paul's absence. This little container if you like, has three important things for church members and three important things for church leaders. And I want to tease out each in turn. Uh, firstly, for church members, there is a call to acknowledge one's leaders and the work they do. It's very easy to be a consumer in church life. We attend a church service and we expect to be served by it. We think of it in terms of customer service. So if the person up the front isn't quite friendly enough or funny enough, we're a bit disappointed. If the songs aren't to our taste, we want to make our opinions known in the hope that our wants are satisfied next time. I was once standing on the doors of All Souls doing welcome duty when someone came out of the church clutching their service sheet and they said, I thought the orchestra was playing today. And I said, I'm sorry, I'm afraid that's next week. And this person left before the service had even started. 
or, or I've stood on the doors of all souls and been asked who the preacher is that day. And on answering the question, I've seen the person who asked me turn around and leave. That has happened to me more than once. And not, I should add, because I was the preacher that week. And I know, a church like All Souls, it lends itself to a consumer mindset. When you have an orchestra, you can't be surprised when people think they're coming to a concert. But it's something we've got to be wary of, and particularly so in this strange new world of online church. It's very easy to shop around. Very easy for a church like All Souls to start building an online audience rather than building a body of genuine fellowship. So we're to acknowledge those who work hard for us and who care for us. Now, secondly, Paul says we're to esteem our leaders for the work they do. We're to hold them in the highest regard in love. That's not to put them on a pedestal and to hero worship them. You see that happening where celebrity pastors have fan clubs. It can happen within a single church of any size. It's not that. Nor is it a blind and unthinking loyalty to everything they say and do. We're to esteem them, not to think they're infallible. None of that. No, it is to recognize godly leadership for what it is. It is service of others which is born out from love. That is honorable and estimable. And thirdly, uh, I take as given in what follows that Paul expects us to respond to our leaders in the work they do. We've seen that directly already in this letter. Uh, Paul has taught these new converts and modeled Christian living for them, and he's seen them respond to his ministry by growing in Christ-likeness. And that is a cause for celebration for Paul. In fact, their growth is his goal and reward. So he says in chapter 2, verse 19, what is our hope, our joy, our crown, in which we will glory in the presence of our Lord Jesus when he comes? Is it not you? We're to respond to godly ministry with growth in godliness. But let's flip this on its head for a moment, because in this same little container, there are three things for leaders to take on board as well. But we've seen them already. Let's see them from the other angle. So firstly, leaders are expected to work hard. They're easy in pastoral ministry to focus your energies on the public things which people see and celebrate you for, while neglecting the private things which people will never see and will never celebrate you for. I've known ministers take anything up to a day out of what is undeniably a busy schedule in order to travel some distance to visit somebody who is sick in hospital or towards the end of their life. And they've got to stand up in a pulpit and preach on Sunday, and in as much as a congregation marks the minister's homework, you might consider it the more effective use of time to play to the crowd. But faithfulness means working hard in the small and hidden things, as well as the big and public things. Tempting, in this time of virtual church and relative isolation, to pick and choose whom to serve. Some people are radiators and some people are drains. Tempting to seek out only the radiators in a time when you can more easily avoid the drains. When there's no shortage of sheep in the pasture, motivation can drop in searching for the lost sheep. But faithful leaders work hard. Uh, secondly, leaders are to be Christ-like. Uh, did you notice that in verse uh, 12? Uh, Acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord. This is crucial. Awfully, appallingly, there are those who find themselves in positions of power and authority in the life of the church and who use that power against those whom they're meant to be serving, who abuse that power. 
It's why no leader should ever have blind loyalty, and certainly why any leader uh, should have anything less than strong accountability. The minister's job is to care for you in the Lord, and it is a particular kind of evil. When they abuse those, they ought to care for in rebellion against the Lord. And the model minister, of course, is always Jesus. Jesus who came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus who came as the good shepherd against the false and bad shepherds who had come before. The false shepherd does not care for the sheep. They're in it for themselves, their own power or preferment or privilege or pleasure or even self-preservation. The Bible says such a person is truly a wolf who is ravaging the flock. It's a particular kind of evil which quite rightly must be identified and exposed and brought to justice by the proper means. The Good Shepherd the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. It's nothing less than Jesus' model of service in self-sacrifice that spiritual leaders are called to follow. And finally, thirdly, leaders are to admonish. Now that's a tough word and I don't want to set it against what we've just said about Christ-likeness in shepherding. Uh, to admonish is not to wag the finger or to berate people in any way. It's not a harsh word. Rather, to admonish is a nurturing word. It's to care for somebody in such a way that you'll draw alongside them when they're going astray and perhaps at cost to yourself, go out of your way to help steer them in the right way. It's being willing to be unpopular for a time, perhaps, but to be, to, to be committed to the truth and to what is good in constant kindness for the sake of others. And maybe it's someone in formal leadership. Maybe it's a friend. I, I hope you have someone in your life who cares enough about you to tell you the truth, who desires so much your growth in Christ likeness that they will call you away from the wide path and steer you towards the narrow one. I hope you have a friend like that, a life group leader, a minister, a pastor, whoever it might be. So honour your leaders. And something there for church members, something for church leaders themselves. But let's speed on much more quickly to see two more things in Paul's top draw. Uh, honour your leaders, firstly. Secondly, love one another. Love one another. And here I'm looking at the very end of verse 13 to verse 15. Live in peace with each other. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive, encourage the disheartened, help the weak, be patient with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. And we've seen already in this letter that there was a big problem in the church in Thessalonica that some people were idle. Uh, my grandmother lived all of her life in a place called Idle in Bradford in West Yorkshire. Uh, and aside from visiting her, my favourite thing to see in the area was the brilliantly named Idle Working Men's Club. You know, it doesn't sit well when you ought to be working to be idle. And here, as he comes to the end of his letter, Paul isn't talking about employment necessarily. He's talking about being idle in our service and love of others. If we are idle and disruptive in the community, we're holding back or even hindering its mission. No, we've got to be active in our service, reaching out and caring and loving. Now, one commentator that I was reading this week suggests that peace is the dominant theme that unites this section of the letter. And when our relationship with God is made right through the self-sacrificial work of Jesus on the cross, so we are freed and enabled to put right our relationships with one another through our own sacrificial service. Instead of heated arguments and hostility with one another, 
We can be at peace with one another. Instead of seeking retribution for sins against one another, we can be quick to forgive one another. Instead of using and extorting and exploiting one another, we can be generous with one another. And uh, notice a typically biblical balance here as well. There are some firm instructions. Paul isn't completely pulling his punctures, but there is a pastoral concern that runs through them all. He gives these instructions for good reasons, and he recognizes that some will be struggling in a particular way. So for the disheartened, for those who feel beaten down by the circumstances they find themselves in, Paul urges the others to encourage them, to draw alongside them, to remind them of the great hope they have in the gospel, to help steer their gaze back towards Christ and his kingdom. For the weak, for those whose faith seems to be faltering or who are in some particular physical need at this time, Paul urges the others to help them. The Christian faith is an outward-focused faith. It's a serving others faith because the Jesus we follow deigned to focus on us and came to serve us, not to be served by us. So honor your leaders and love one another. Thirdly and finally, as I close, seek the Lord. Seek the Lord. That's the last little container of important things from Paul's top drawer. He starts with prayer in verse 16. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. It's important to see that Paul isn't denying or dismissing the difficult aspects of life here. He's gone out of his way to speak into those things earlier in the letter, of relational difficulties, of spiritual doubts, of loss and grief. Paul isn't suddenly saying none of that matters. Just smile, be happy, always look on the bright side of life. No, it's more nuanced than that. He doesn't say give thanks for every circumstance that you face as you face it. Rather, he says, give thanks in all circumstances. In other words, wherever you find yourself in the midst of that, give thanks to God from where you are, not necessarily for where you are. There is a great biblical truth that the Lord works often in the midst of struggle to draw us closer to himself. When you find yourself there, look to him, pray to him, give thanks to him. And Paul might say, listen to him. Verse 19, do not quench the spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Hold on to what is good, reject every kind of evil. We live in a world where countless voices call out to us and seek to sway us in this direction or that. Paul says, seek the Lord and listen to him. So as the Holy Spirit does his work in your life, convicting you of sin, moving you to worship, stirring you to good works as you seek to please God, as the Holy Spirit does his work, don't resist him. The idea of quenching the spirit here has the sense of putting out a fire. Some of us are very good at pulling out our spiritual fire blankets and smothering the flames of what the Lord might be doing in our lives. Paul says don't quench the spirit. Prophecies in Paul's day were perhaps a little different to our day. Uh, At the very least, they were in a time before the New Testament, and so those listening to them needed to test what they were hearing against the scriptures of the Old Testament and the witness of the apostles. Now, we've got the whole canon of scripture today, so we're in a good position to test all that we hear. Now, I suppose that some of us, by instinct, will be more inclined to expect bad or malign motives in those we hear speaking. Others, more inclined to listen and follow unquestioningly. Paul is balanced again. Test it all. Reject what is bad. Hold on to what is good. Through it all, listen to God. Seek the Lord. 
Because having said all of that we've said about Christian living and about godly behavior and so on, we can't miss the most fundamental message of this whole letter. The real heartbeat of it and its driving force is that we would know God for who he is. We would know the love and grace and peace of our Father in heaven. We would know the near salvation of the Son who will come in glory to make his home among us fully and finally and forever. We would know the life-giving work of the Holy Spirit in us and through us as he makes us holy and brings forth fruit in us, in the world. And our little mantra from chapter 4, verses 1 to 3, one final time, what does God want from us? That we would please him. What does God want for us? That we would be sanctified in all the fullness of that. So if I may then, let me end with a prayer. A prayer that we will be those who take on the message of this great letter to the Thessalonians and who carry it deep in our hearts. A prayer that we may be changed by the Spirit as we await the return of the Son to the glory of our Father in heaven. I'm going to pray verses 23 and 24 for us. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. Amen.